is a lovely way to start the day. I didn't even mean to rhyme. I'm so excited to be here talking about um, what has been a labor of love for many, many years. Before um, working on Mightyverse, I've worked on software projects that have reached hundreds of millions of people with Shockwave and with Flash Video. People have suggested that um, my work creating, um, helping to create the first version of After Effects has changed an industry. But with each of those projects, there was a time at the beginning when we labored to create a new tool or a new experience for an audience of dozens. And it was in those times that the magic happened. So today, I'm going to tell you about my diverse. I'm going to share moments of painful failure and of joyful success. I don't know where this is all going, um, but I know that we're already reaching our audience of dozens and more than dozens. And I hope that some of the techniques that I share with you today will inspire some work from you and help you fail quickly and move on to the next success. So Mightyverse, um, our big vision is to create a network for sharing language and culture. The idea is for the people to create and benefit from a global corpus of human spoken language. At its heart, it's thousands, someday millions, of tiny phrase videos where people record a phrase in their native language and it's cross-translated to other languages. When we started, the idea was it would be a marketplace and that language experts would share their knowledge with other people and we would capture the language that um, you can't find in a dictionary and things that are too colloquial or um, niche to respond well in Google Translate. We also have a social mission where um, we're missing a slide picture here. Oh, it's a build. Surprise. Um, so our social mission has um, this idea that we could help the languages that are disappearing in the world. Over almost 50% of the world's languages are at risk. And the people who decide whether a language lived, lives or dies are three years old. So our children decide whether they're going to speak their native tongue or their, the, 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 the language of their parents. And it's based on, they make these decisions, we believe, based on the values in society. So our hope is that Mightyverse can start to put forth the value of the diversity of language and culture, and so that young people will decide to speak the language of their parents, and we will preserve and revitalize the diversity of culture in our world. So at the beginning of Mightyverse, actually my beginning, um, I call myself a co-founder, but it's actually started a, a few years um, before I came on board. Um, Mightyverse was a web app written in Rails 2.1 using the Globalize plugin. Anybody remember that? Before, a few people, before Rails had internationalization. And then it had something, I can't remember what we used before device. Um, it also had a mobile app that um, was a Flash app, which in 2008, before the iPhone, that seemed like a good technical choice. Um, and it, was, um, it wasn't released because at that time you had to have de deals with carriers. We also had a desktop app for mass recording of these little phrase videos, and we still use that app today. So the web app was my challenge when I came on board. I was going to add this recording feature so that people could record on the web and we could fulfill this crowdsourcing idea and fix a few bugs. And I needed to learn Rails and Ruby. So I, um, I got into the code base and um, then realized that it wasn't just a few bugs. It was as often happens when you're starting development and you don't have it out in front of real, real users, there was all sorts of stuff that was implemented just before the next demo and it was more of a prototype than a full application. So what I really needed to do was finish application development. So we reset our sites on exactly what this first release was going to be. 
And at the same time, I was paying attention to Eric Reese, who was really um, blogging with um, Startup Lessons Learned and popularizing this idea of an MVP, uh, that, which he defined as the smallest thing you can learn from. He defined a build, learn, build, measure, learn cycle, which I like to actually think should be learn, build, measure. Um, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and so we defined our minimally viable product. We decided that we were going to launch something that was perhaps not useful for real people to use to learn language or communicate, but it would be something that we could learn from, that we could reach an audience and get, get started and, and be working more with release software. So in getting into one of the exciting things that I um, wanted to learn with Ruby was test-first development. And um, what I found is that tests were really helpful in defining the project, defining the product. I was new to this code base. And it had some tests, but they didn't fully cover the functionality, which is part of the reason that there was these sort of mysterious features that we thought were features, but were actually static text on the page. Um, so we built a number of tests that helped us understand what the product did and really then define the product. So we used automated testing and wrote a lot of tests and did this epic upgrade to Rails 2.2, and we launched this site in June 2009. And so the smallest possible thing that we could think of um, had the ability to access our then 22,000 phrases with um, search and these episodic phrase lists. So we did this little feature that let us highlight interesting things on the page. And then we used those phrase lists later that year to engage with real people and get them to use Mightyverse as it was intended. We packaged up specific phrase lists that we built for specific people, one going to Japan, one going to Italy, and um, two people going to Russia. This, um, these images are from Ty Roberts, who went on a business trip to Japan. And the, one of the phrase lists he asked for was to find coffee in Japan. And he used it very successfully with his broken Japanese to, re, to play and, and engage with people who didn't speak any English. And it was really delightful. And Glenn followed him around and made a video of it. And it was hugely successful and great. What we didn't publicize is that um, <clears throat> actually one of the early Mightyverse investors was the person who went to Italy. He spoke no Italian, and he used Mightyverse when he got into a shop in rural Italy um, where the storekeeper didn't speak English. And so he played a phrase to the storekeeper who got so excited, he just talked for five minutes in Italian. <laughs> and. Um, he came back to the United States and said, I sure hope I'm not your target audience. So we learned by doing this painful experimentation and having a fairly, you know, in our little world public failure, we learned something really important, which is that what we're really interested in is intermediate language learners, people increasing their fluency. As it turns out that that's actually a tremendous number of people, and there are very few resources for people out of, after they get out of the beginner stage. So we were going through this cycle, um, which this is what my consulting company, Blazing Cloud, kind of re-articulated of Eric Reese's cycle, um, where build isn't even on this, right? So you only build if that's your only way to test. And this I really believe in, and I think in many ways, launching that site in 2009 we launched it before we, it wasn't the simplest possible thing we can learn from. And, um, and I'll share with you some more ideas about how we did that. So, so the idea is you go through this cycle and you should enter at the learning stage, and then you come up with a hypothesis, and then you try to test that hypothesis, and then you analyze what you've learned. And I'm gonna talk through a few of those cycles we've gone through in Mightyverse. So, a lot of people believe that the majority of people in the world now actually speak multiple languages. It, you know, some people say a third. It depends um, what you mean by to speak a language. You know, do I speak Spanish even though 
Um, I was fluent 20 some years ago, and now I forget most of the vocabulary. I'd say so, maybe on a good day. So I'm curious in the audience, how many people speak another language? I'd say not half, maybe a third, maybe 20%. Um, in America, it's actually, as you might guess, um, not as common to speak multiple languages as in other countries. Um, and, but it's interesting that that's changing. 50% of all current college students actually have an active passport, and 30% have used it in the last year. Now, some of them might be doing the Club Med experience, but it's my hope that we're becoming more of a global culture. So with this huge swath of people who are learning to speak or already speaking another language and might have a need for Mighty Verse, how do we find them? Well, we reframe that question, as you often do when you're building a product, which is how could our target audience found, find us? We had this asset, which is these you know, 22,000 phrases that have been collected over a few years, and um, we looked at Google Trends. And it turns out a lot of people just type into Google, how do you say this? Right? How can you say this in this language? You know, even in um, other languages, you know, if you looked for um, como se dice, it has like a similar trend. So we thought, wow, you know, we've got this kind of long tail content that should really work well for organic search. So if we look at our website, it turns out that we'd in inadvertently hidden all the content from Google. So we had these episodic phrase lists, so if something was on the front page, you could see maybe um, you know, a few dozen phrases, and then everything else was behind this search box. So that was um, sobering and um, a little embarrassing, but it had a fairly easy fix, which is I made a page for every one of these phrases, which is, of course, just a single template in Rails, and, um, and then indexed them through a new navigation which is through the speakers. And this is not that I thought that, you know, it's the most valuable thing for people to browse through speakers, but when I'm doing um, search engine optimization, what I always try to do is do something for the humans as well as for the search engines. Because the search engines are changing their algorithms all the time, and if you do the thing that the humans want, then they'll more likely move their algorithm to match your website, not the other way around. So, um, so I made this page which had all of the speakers and then linked to all of the speakers' phrases. And then in two and a half months, our traffic increased by a factor of eight. And it was really incredible and rewarding. And this continued to climb throughout the year and into early January the next year. Um, and then something weird happened. Um, so if you look at this graph, the first half of this graph looks awesome, right? In fact, it looks really awesome at the end. And then um, something terrible happened. <laughs> um, and so I was like, well, let, let's look. I can look back, you know, my commit logs and try to figure out what was going on. So what happened before that awesome time? Um, I did the Rails 3 upgrade. Whew. So maybe that was it. Um, actually, we got some press. Um, that happened at the same time, and they only mentioned our name, not a link to the site. So it was sort of hard to see in the traffic. Um, but we sort of sleuthed through the Google Analytics, and we found that out. Um, so then what happened? Well, it turns out in early February, I um, broke caching on the site. And if your site is slow, Google doesn't like that. Um, in fact, people don't like it. So um, it really uh, affected our traffic significantly. And what's worse than that is um, I didn't notice this for six weeks um, when then I fixed the caching and our traffic went back and started to climb again. Um, and this is like really terrible because with search engine optimization, if your traffic gets, um, you can fix the problem and it takes a while for it to recover, right? Because then you start to look like a flaky site. Um, so at the beginning of this time, I had green tests. Like, that's a problem. And you know, maybe I could have gone back and, and wrote a test for that specific bug. And I think I did. But I was really worried that that wasn't going to actually detect this type of problem, because the next thing that affected 
Um, Google traffic could be anything. Um, and I'm not even, you know, now I'm kind of an expert at SEO, but I certainly wasn't then. So I went to the Google Analytics console, which is huge, and I found these um, custom alerts. And I wrote this alert, and I set a low watermark for my traffic. And I said, OK, if traffic hits, goes below this, if search traffic goes below this, then I want an alert. And every like six to months to a year, I would like increase that number. And, um, but mostly, I forgot about it. And then like a couple of years later, I get this alert. And the traffic's gone down significantly. Um, and I was actually really glad I had this type of test because I'd implemented something completely different. Actually, somehow um, I'd changed the configuration for staging and production. And so the robots.txt I had to make um, staging not be indexed was um, no longer being served up. So suddenly I had two sites with identical content being indexed by the search engines. And then Mightyverse just looked like a content farm, which really um, depresses your search results. So, um, so it took a while to find that root cause, but if I hadn't had that alert, then it would have been really hard to isolate and I would have found it much later, which would have had much more significant effect. So this is kind of my first big lesson, which is to look at tests that are outside our automated tests, that we have these effects that we want to achieve in the world, right? How do we measure those? Automated tests are just your first line of defense. So I believe every web application should have an immune system. And I aspire for this to be a self-correcting immune system like the continuous deployment people do. Um, but for now, I just have a couple of these alerts. But I really try to think about that because, you know, all my tests are green. And then um, now I'm um, pretty excited that my traffic grows year after year. But is my software really working? So, as it turns out, no. Um, I didn't really aspire to make what Mightyverse has on the site right now, which is effectively a visual phrase dictionary. All of our traffic comes in, it grows year over year, and then it's like a sieve, it just goes through, because there's really not much there on the site. I still believed in this idea of a language exchange, where this social game where people could like exchange phrases and learn from each other. And with this, you know, SEO thing, we had this idea of this, you know, sort of content creation feedback loop where, where people, like, ask their friends to share phrases and they go into the database and they make phrase pages and then that creates a great loop which then actually could achieve this amazing social mission because we'd have these tools where people are putting in endangered languages and big languages and all great things except we don't actually have that crowdsourcing feature. Um, so we decided, but it's kind of a big thing. We've tried to do little bits of that crowdsourcing feature before, and little bits of it just weren't working. It had to have this kind of feedback loop, we believed. So that was our new assumption, that without a rewarding feedback loop, um, the crowdsourcing of phrases wouldn't really take off. So we decided to use crowdfunding for that validation. So crowdfunding is kind of like this lean startup landing page technique. So if you've ever done this or heard about it, you basically create an ad for your project, product, you create a landing page, you drive traffic to that landing page, and then you look at the conversion rate to see if your idea resonates with people. And if it doesn't resonate, it doesn't mean that your idea is bad, maybe you're just not articulating it well. So crowdfunding is this sort of lean startup landing page technique on st steroids. So the idea is you start with an ad for your product that's your campaign, and then people actually give you money to pre-order your product, and if they give you enough that you can build your product, then you build it. And we thought that this would be like a really good way, and I was just rounding up this fellowship last year, and I said, okay, let's do this crowdfunding campaign, and if we raise enough money, I'll take a few months off and I'll build this thing. And I kind of think that we could build this, you know, this app in my head, um, we could scope something that's a few months. So we had, there were four drivers of crowdfunding success that we, you know, we did a bunch of research and we figured out. One, make a video. Got that, no problem, we already had a plan. Multiple founders, no problem. Ask for less than 10K, this turns out to be a big success factor. But, um, you know, I can't live off 10, 10K for a few months. So um, we're like, okay, well, we won't go have that, we'll just, you know, put a lot into making our ad successful. And then the fourth success factor is experience running a crowdfunding campaign before. So we don't have that either. But we decided we were just going to go forth 
and figure out how we were going to crowdsource language and do this campaign anyhow. So literally, we went back to the drawing board. We did a whole bunch of sketches about what we wanted our app to be. We figured out our micro-tasking, what's our life cycle of the phrase, how are we going to leverage our community of bilinguals and language learners. And we really wanted to make the experience fun. I believe that language learning at its best is intrinsically fun. So how can we capture that and make that more so? We did a bunch of research on designing games. Because I've designed game platforms, but I've never actually designed a game before. So you know, had a lot to learn there. I love this talk, Getting Gam Gamification Right, by Sebastian Dieter Dieterding. He talks about key elements of meaning and mastery and autonomy. And I really thought hard about how we could fold these ideas into our game design. He mentioned a quote that I'd heard before and I love by Raph Koster, which is that fun is just another word for learning. But he framed it differently, where he said that fun is another word for learning under optimal conditions. So how could we create an app that creates those optimal conditions? He underscored that the design process for creating a fun experience is key. It's not the features, but you need to have a process that helps you figure this out. He said something that I believe and I've already talked about, which is knowing your users. And like many people, he said, you must create a paper prototype. Play test and iterate. You don't know it's fun until people start having fun. So we took our design of our app. We met in a cafe with index cards and little penny markers and Sharpies and all sorts of things. And we made up a game. And our first test was, did we have fun? Now, maybe we're not the target audience. I mean, Iku is a um, native Japanese speaker who um, is always wanting to learn more English, even though she's quite fluent. And I've taken a few Japanese classes, and we did the, the game in Japanese. And so we were sort of um, first pass, right? And yes, we had total fun. We made up this game we later called Phrase Swap, where we would like sort of generate ideas um, in our own languages for around a theme, and then we would match them up and challenge it ourselves to like translate the ones that didn't have matches. And we um, <clears throat> we thought this was great, and we scheduled a meeting the next week to kind of figure out, fine tune the gameplay. So meanwhile, during that week, we, we kind of reflected on this. And we realized that we had actually created a game that encoded the worst practices of language learning, which was translation, right? You're, you really should like immerse yourself in language. Paul was reading this great book by Leanne Hinton about like how do you teach language when you, there's like one native speaker left, you know, when you don't have any courses. So we, our test number two is, our are we moving toward our goal? And that was not successful. So we realized this like as we're on our way to our second uh, design session. And um, on the spot, we made up a new game, which involved having one person who is a native language speaker of the language everybody else was learning. And these phrases, you know, which you would then act out, like, um, you know, my, sorry to, my Japanese isn't so good, but you'd be like, Denwa okakuru. Denwa okakuru. And then the per other people would have to guess what that means without speaking English. You know, we had like, ino ga suki desu. You know, my, this means um, like nice doggy. Um, <laughs> so my dog wasn't like super excited about being part of this play test, but you know, I worked around that. You know, there's other ways to express dogginess. So, we were like super excited about this game that really helped us move towards our goal. And it was interesting because both games were fun. The first game was kind of closer to the mobile app we designed, but the second game was much, much simpler. And it only required one bilingual player. We realized this could actually work as a card game. And we made the really difficult and weird choice to actually produce a card game for our crowdfunding campaign. This was very, very hard, because we, 
I came up with this idea, like, let's get experience doing a crowdfunding campaign. We raised a few thousand dollars, and, you know, we could just make this card game. But that felt like this whole departure. Like, are we pivoting and becoming a card game company? Like, not so much. So, um, so we did, uh, but we realized that we really were going to have to play test this game for a couple of months, and we might as well run this crowdfunding game while we did it. So the third test was, would anybody else play our game? We found this meetup that we'd actually been to a bunch of times before called SF Babble. Meetups are a great place to find people to do experimentation with. Um, so this is this place where people come and they speak any language and they get matched up and it's, it really does sound like Babble. Um, and um, we played our game, we had the game on index cards in Spanish, Japanese, and English and we played it with three groups of people. Um, Matt Leacock, who's um, a well-known board game designer, has this great quote about that he says, just shut up and sit in the corner and watch. So we couldn't do that at SF Babel because we didn't have really good rules. So we wrote, went home and wrote some rules, and I recruited some people who were learning Spanish because that's one of my languages, and um, we had a play test. So let me tell you how you know if your game is working. So this kid... I don't know if you can see that, but he's totally checked out. He's like regretting coming to this session. This other kid is kind of totally bored and embarrassed that his mom is making us read the rules aloud again. <laughs> Pro tip, if your rules like don't fit well on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, like don't even bother to test them, like start over. So what was great is after the rules were read and that was really painful and took like 45 minutes. The game was actually fun. Like, this is what fun looks like. So um, we, uh, we launched this crowdfunding campaign. We ended up setting our goal at $5,500 because we you know, actually had to produce the game for less than it would cost to sell it. Um, and we raised $7,300, and it was really exciting. And we're now producing this game in um, Spanish. It's at the printer. I have a prototype right here. And, um, and we're working on a Japanese version, which was instigated from the crowdfunding campaign. So I want to share a couple of last stories and invite you to do a experiment with me. Um, so we did this, what I thought was like this fabulous video. Um, my partners actually run a creative agency that does video production, so they were, like, horrified at the, like, you know, they were like, if this was a real video, we would reshoot it. Um, but I was like, oh, my God, it's such high production value. We used, you know, these cards that we printed on our inkjet printer. And, um, and this is actually, like, the, the inkjet play cards that, that we made that we can just, like, I can print out at home. And um, the... Uh, the front of our crowdfunding campaign said, Digame, except that it was spelled wrong. <laughs> so we got this message on YouTube from um, this guy who said, I think it's a cool idea, but there's typos in the cards in your video. And I was horrified, because I know how to spell this word. Um, and I didn't spell it right. So. Um, my amazing partners did some agile video production, and they replaced key frames of the video so that it would have the accent over the eye, which is really, really important to Spanish speakers. And this guy, Estevez, I ended up reaching out to him, and he helped me with the translation of all of the cards, and we went like back and forth over Google Docs, and it was just awesome. I've never met him in person. Um, but he sort of just got involved in the, this game. And then um, our final play test, or one of our last play tests, um, we held at Ninefold. Thank you, Ninefold people, for hosting this. And um, I just want to say, that is what fun looks like. <laughs> so, um, so what did we learn? We ended up spending seven months on this friggin' card game. Like, I never, I don't think I would have done it if I thought, knew it was going to take so long. But we didn't really spend seven months on the card game. We spent seven months really validating our model of language learning. Almost everything we learned applies to our mobile app, to what we're going to 
do next? And the game itself created this ecosystem. As it turns out, in any group of 10 people, there's in the United States, like three or four of them are learning Spanish or one, somebody's fluent in Spanish. Just talking to my friends and everywhere I went over lunch about this card game flushed out the people in my network who wanted to help me. That I never would have, you know, I'm not gonna go ask everybody I know, so what language are you learning? Are you learning a language? Which is what I was doing before and it was really, really slow. This totally sped up my learning at the risk of, at the cost of these embarrassing faux pas. And that was just the most egregious one of them. So we have a new experimental iPhone app built by um, John Fox, who actually made the, he's become a really good friend of mine, but he made the very first um, desktop app that we still use today. And um, this is, um, you can use it, let's see if I can get to, You can use it to, um, I need to mirror the display, I can't see my mouse. Oh, there it is. Here is just another word so first. So I recorded this phrase today on my iPhone and posted it to Mightyverse which is really, really exciting. And so I want to invite you to experiment with me. And so I have prizes. I have this that I've, that's never been opened. This is a test from the printer that is our real game that will be in stores in the next few weeks, um, and uh, not real stores. That's a whole other story. And then also this prototype game, which has all the same parts, but it's printed on an inkjet printer. And so if you want a copy of what, one of these two games at the end of the day, or if you're interested in the Japanese game, which I can't give you today, but I can send you a copy when we have it, so if you're interested in the Spanish game, tweet at Mightyverse, how do you say whatever you want to say in Spanish and then with the Rocky Mountain Ruby hashtag? Or if you want the Japanese game, then tweet at Mightyverse, how do you say whatever in Japanese with the hashtag? And then um, we're going to do some behind the scenes hopeful awesomeness and um, we will tweet back at you the phrase, which may not be today, but will be soon. But we are going to then judge these submissions based on sort of randomly, but with a waiting for creativity. So um, the idea is, you know, be the first one to tweet a phrase that we don't have in the database. And, um, and if we do have it in the database, we can send it right back to you and um, participate in this contest. So I want to um, close with a quote by Kent Beck, where he says, agile is what works. And I want to challenge everyone, especially the developers in the room, that when we think of agile, often we think of test first development, we think of getting our stories done, we think of you know, having reasonable velocity. Um, but agile goes way, way beyond that and think about every line of code you write, think all the way to the end user. What's this for? How are they gonna use it? And how am I gonna know that this actually works for the real person who will use this software? Thank you.